Hi, welcome. Today we're going to be talking about the Creating Compassionate Children campaign. And the Unicorn Children's Foundation has made it possible for teachers to receive a kit, the Creating Compassionate Children kit. And we're very excited to share with you today about all the things that this kit can afford your classroom and the children that you teach. Who is Unicorn Children's Foundation? We're a 22-year-old nonprofit organization dedicated to building communities of acceptance, support, and opportunities for individuals and families challenged by special needs and neurodiversity. What we do is we care for our community. C, we connect people to community resources. A, we advocate for those to have inclusive opportunities, people with special needs. R, we respect differences. E, we empower individuals, and S, we support success for everyone. So the name of the kit is the Creating Compassionate Children kit, and we want to talk about what compassion is. What do you think compassion is? Have you had times when people showed you compassion? Have you had times that you wish someone would have shown you compassion? Compassion is actually something that we can teach children to have. Do you think that children that enter your classroom today might have less compassion than children that you might have taught 10 to 15 years ago? Well, the definition of compassion is the ability to understand others' point of view and their distress, putting yourself in their shoes. It has very important implications for community building. The Creating Compassionate Children campaign is not only about autism. Though, I am going to show you this video today because it represents all people with neurodiversity in the sense that people see things in different ways and experience the world in a different way. So I'd like to show you this video and ask you to please just be open-minded and think about how you might process the world differently than other people. And this video was made with, by someone who has autism. We are all different, and that's wonderful. Some differences are easy to see. Height, hairstyle, eye color, and so on. Other differences can't be seen. Our favorite foods, fears, or special skills. Interestingly, the way we see the world is also different. For instance, what do you see in this drawing? Most people see a duck, but some of you might have seen a rabbit. Whichever you saw, you are correct. This is just a trick drawing to show you that all brains work differently. The brain is your body's computer. It works differently for all of us and controls how you learn. That's why we are all good at different things. How you feel, which is why we all feel different emotions, and how you communicate. <laughs> Sometimes the brain is connected in such a way it affects senses and how we perceive and read situations and interactions. This is known as autism. Many people have autism, so it's likely you already know someone who is autistic. And for this reason, it's useful to know a little bit about autism. The special wiring inside an autistic brain can sometimes make the person good at tasks we may find difficult, such as mathematics, drawing, or music. It can also do the opposite, and activities we find too easy are incredibly difficult to learn, such as making friends. 
The senses constantly send information to your brain about your surroundings and other people. However, when a person's brain and its senses don't communicate well, the brain can become overwhelmed and confused, affecting how they see the world. Picture yourself walking down the street. This is how an autistic brain may experience the same walk. Scary, isn't it? Sadly, in many cases, the person can't say out loud how they feel. So, even though there's chaos going on in their heads, they seem okay on the outside, unable to ask for help. We will develop behaviors to help us feel calm in uncomfortable situations. We may look away, hug ourselves, chew our fingernails, fidget, bite our lips, and so on. Equally, autistic people develop behaviors that help them cope with these intense moments. These actions may seem unusual, but they're just their way to feel calm. When they happen, it means they are having a hard time. The kind thing to do is not to give them an even harder time by getting cross, ignoring them, or mocking them. Remember, just because a PlayStation can't read an Xbox game, it doesn't mean it's broken. People with autism need friends who are willing to take the time to know them. With good communication and plenty of patience, everyone would be better off. People with autism are not ill or broken. They simply have a unique view of the world. And with a little support from their friends, they might just be able to share that view with us. Autism can make amazing things happen. So I hope that this video helped you develop some compassion for children that may not act and look or do things differently um, than other people do. A lot of these behaviors can be hard to handle, but I know if we have more compassion and if we teach children to have more compassion for one another, that everyone can be successful. And also it can give us as teachers more patience. So, how many of you have children, um, if you have a typical VBK classroom or pre-K classroom or first or second grade or so on, how many have children in their classroom that are identified with special needs? Even though teachers today may not be a quote unquote special ed teacher, we're finding that a, there's a huge increase of children with mental health issues, um, with neurodiversity, a lot of kids that are undiagnosed yet, especially if you're a pre-K teacher, and they're in your classroom, and you may not necessarily have the background on how to deal with these children. And so that's also one of the reasons that Creating Compassionate Children um, campaign has been written and is being offered to classrooms to equip teachers with skills um, to deal with behavioral issues, if there's some, and how to build community in their classroom. Inclusion is the law, federal law, by IDEA, I-D-E-A. So there's more and more a push for inclusion. 61.8% um, of children with disabilities spend 80% of their time in regular ed classrooms and in class of inclusive classrooms. We know that regular ed, quote unquote, regular ed um, students have a more positive outlook of their classroom and of themselves when they are involved in inclusion. Sadly, 85% of children with special needs become or are victims of bullies, bullying at some point in their life. They're easy victims because they might act differently, might have unusual mannerisms, and may not understand even when people are picking on them. So they're often bullied, which I know breaks your heart as well. They're two to three more times more likely to be bullied than um, other students that are, do not have an exceptionality. And then speaking about older children, 
27.8% of children between the ages of 12 and 18 are victims of bullying. One in three are victims of cyberbullying. That's a whole new world um, open to bullies now to take advantage of people and mock them um, through technology. You know, with bullying, starting young and continuing through a child's life, it affects self-esteem and also can cause children to want to commit suicide. So our goal is to help create compassion and build the capacity in children to have compassion for other children so they are less likely to become bullies. So really, bully prevention is key. And you as the teacher are a huge part of that, of what type of community you help build. I want to share with you about two children that I taught when I was in pre-K. I taught an inclusive um, classroom similar to the BBK classrooms in Florida. And I really absolutely loved the relationships that developed between my typical peers and the children with neurodiversity in my classroom. These two children, Sammy and Charlotte, became really good friends. Sammy had autism. Sammy would not try any food unless they were white. He wouldn't try going on the slide, no motions like that. They all scared him. And Charlotte spent a lot of her time with um, Sammy, teaching him and encouraging him to try different things. She was his champion. And one day she even got to him to try a different food that was not white. And that was such an exciting day to be able to let his mom know that happened. None of his therapists got it to happen, but she did. All children can benefit from inclusion. Even those who are quote unquote neurotypical, they get the opportunity to become leaders. They get the opportunity to feel confident about their skills. And they also learn patience and they learn compassion. The child with special needs with neurodiversity has research shows that when they spend more time with typical children, they have better increases in their language development as well as their social skills. So it's really a win-win for everyone. It's just a matter of equipping the teachers with the resources and the knowledge to help um, inclusion be successful. Also, a big part of the Creating Compassionate Children campaign is an evidence-based strategy called peer-mediated instruction and intervention. It's evidence-based. It's a way to let to help your neurotypical children interact with children with special needs that helps work on objectives that have been pinpointed for the child that has special needs. There's a webinar that's included in your curriculum guide that's part of the kit. And in it, it's, um, there's a webinar on peer mediated instruction that you can look up that is free. And I'll be talking about some ways the book can be used to promote peer mediated instruction. If you don't know about it, I recommend you learn more about it because it's an easy strategy to implement and it's also extremely effective. So now we're gonna talk about the components of your toolkit. You have a book in there, Exceptionally Good Friends, Building Relationships with Autism. I'm gonna tell you a little more about that. A teacher's guide, get caught being kind cards, brain break cards, sensory fidget toys, and a promise ribbon. All of these together are a complete kit to help build a classroom that is full of compassion and understanding. And it will also help cut down on behavior problems because there's a lot of behavioral principles that are introduced in the book. I'm the author of Exceptionally Good Friends, Building Relationships with Autism. And the reason why I wrote this book is being a teacher in the public school um, system for 20 years and being involved in inclusion the entire time, that's one of my passions, I saw that so many teachers were not, needed some support in learning strategies to help kids that were in their classroom be successful. Also, it was inspired by the two children you met earlier and their relationship and many other children that I had the honor of teaching and the privilege of teaching over my 20 years that developed special relationships that benefited both the children. The book was honored and it was really exciting and um, amazing. The book was honored with the, Dr. the Autism Society's Dr. Temple Grandin Outstanding Literary Work of 2015. And if you don't know who, who Dr. Temple Grandin is, she is 
kind of the first person with autism who is able to really speak out about what it's like to have autism and also champion the rights of people with autism and give us an insight into their mind. And she's someone I've always admired, so it was a great privilege to meet her and give her a copy of my book. The book is told from two perspectives. It's told from the perspective of Ruthie, who is a neurotypical child, about her new friend Clay, who is a child with autism. And once again, I want to point out, though the book does talk about autism, the strategies in the book and the whole purpose of the Creating Compassionate Children campaign is to help all children understand that everyone is different. So even if there's not a special child in your classroom at this time, it is still something that should be implemented to help children have compassion for one another's differences and understand their own differences. So I'm gonna talk now about the book and how it can be used with the children in your classroom. I know a lot of you have young children um, or children that might have shorter attention spans at the beginning of the school year. We know that kids can only sit for a certain amount of time. Please modify the book by, if necessary, reading only one of the stories and then reading the other story later. And another part, I kind of jumped ahead of myself. The story is told from Ruthie's point of view, and then you flip the book over and you have the point of view of Clay, the little boy that has autism. So you get both of their points of view as they develop a friendship and how they experience their daily life in their classroom. Apologize for jumping ahead like that. So you're gonna start off by reading Ruthie's story. As I said, you can please adapt the book to your children. If you need to paraphrase some of the language, as we all do with some books, please do so. I find that children, um, four-year-olds, can sit for the whole story because they find the story really interesting because they see their classroom being reflected in the book because it represents a typical classroom or classroom for children with special needs as well. In your curriculum guide, there's questions to help you ask the children to, um, to help them develop thinking, critical thinking skills about the story and uh, ask also questions to help them think about how they can be a compassionate friend to the other children in the classroom. So I'm going to read to you Ruthie's story and talk about the behavioral strategies that are embedded in the book. There's one more key uh, component of the book I'm a board certified behavior analyst and I've learned, I became a board certified behavior analyst after being a teacher in the classroom um, for 18 years and then I became a board certified behavior analyst and was still in the classroom for a while and now I work independently. But I found that I wish I had all the strategies that I learned in school as a BCBA, a board certified behavior analyst, I wish someone had told me these strategies when I started my teaching career, because all of a sudden the things that I did that worked, I could see the behavioral principles behind them and the evidence and the science behind it. So I could use those strategies more effectively and more often and apply them to the right situation. So something I've done, I think the best way to learn these strategies is really to be with a teacher who uses them and you get to watch them and be coached. Since teachers don't have that opportunity all the time, I wrote the book so that you could see Mrs. Hope, the teacher, demonstrating these strategies. Then in the middle of the book is a whole section specifically for adults, and it has evidence-based strategies that have been, point, been pinpointed by the autism, um, an autism group that has pinpointed 11 evidence-based strategies that are recommended to be used with children with autism and also children with any type of behavioral issue. These can be applied with any child. And you'll find when you apply these strategies, you'll have more success for all the children in your classroom. Because when I became more mindful and used a lot of these strategies, my whole classroom functioned better as a whole. And like I said, I had eight children with special needs and eight children that were quote unquote neurotypical. So I wanna encourage you to really think about these strategies and how you might implement them in your classroom, as well as ways to help children develop compassion. Exceptionally Good Friends, Building Relationships with Autism. 
Book one, you're going to read Ruthie's story first. When you're done with Ruthie's story, you can read Clay's story later at another date, or you can go through the whole book, of course, judging your children. In the book, at the very beginning, I have the early red flags of autism, just so you'll know. And then in the middle of the book are all your evidence-based strategies. You access those from Clay's story. My name is Ruthie, and a new boy started school today. His name is Clay. Guess what? He's the cutest little boy I've ever seen. He seems so scared, he doesn't talk. The sweet little guy just cries and hums really loudly and flaps his hands. Mrs. Hope reminds us that even though everybody is different, we can all still be exceptionally good friends. And that's one of the key messages of the book. The whole class welcomes him to our school family by singing a special, a special welcome song. Welcome to our class. Oh no, he covers his ears and frowns. Maybe the music hurts his ears. Mrs. Hope goes over our class rules by showing us pictures of children playing together, sharing, picking up their work, and more. Next, she shows Clay our schedule for the whole day. Clay looks at each picture as Mrs. Hope explains each part of her school day. We all love to talk about our schedule. I feel safe and happy knowing what will happen each day. The evidence-based strategy that's displayed on this page is using... A schedule, a visual schedule. Children who have anxiety about transitions, a lot of your four-year-olds and children coming in the beginning of school, having a visual schedule at eye level for all children helps them move e more easily throughout the day and helps cut down on transitions. Then in the middle of the book, and I'm going to show you from this side, we have the evidence-based strategy. So we have the page number of the book, page two and three, why schedules are evidence-based strategies, and also free resources to print up your own schedule. When you're reading the book to the children, there's questions in your curriculum guide. And there's also just statements, things for you to point out. Even though Clay comes into the classroom and he looks or he acts differently, he doesn't look differently, Ruthie doesn't think mean thoughts about him. Instead, she thinks, I want to be his friend and get to know him. So when you see people who act or look differently, make the decision to think kind things about them and make the effort to get to know them. Every morning we get to exercise. Mrs. Hope says exercise gets our brains and bodies ready to learn and it makes us healthy and super strong. I can pull a friend in a wagon. I can ride a bicycle or a scooter. I can hop on a hippity hop or I can do jumping jacks or windmills with my friends. Yay! I choose a blue scooter and I zoom around. Clay chases me. He likes me. Mrs. Hope tries to get Clay to hop like a frog on the hippity hop. He pulls away from her and screams and cries. I wonder, has he ever seen a hippity hop before today? I grab the red hippity hop, my favorite, and face Clay, bouncing like a kangaroo. Like this, Clay. One, two, three. Clay's face lights up with a smile. He sits on the hippity hop just like me. Yay, Clay! He counts. I can hear him. He can count all the way up to 25. What a smart boy he is. I think I want to hop and count with my new friend every day at exercise time. So what did Ruthie do to be a good friend to Clay? You can ask the children that. Yeah, she sat in front of him and she showed him how to do something that scared him. That's part of peer mediated instruction, the evidence-based um, strategy I talked to you about. And you can teach children in your classroom to show other children, model things for their friends, to help their friends learn new ways of doing things, but helping them be conscious of that. And they all love to be the expert on something and show someone else. You can be an exceptionally good friend, you can tell the children, by helping a friend who's afraid try something new by showing them how to do it. Every day at center time, Clay chooses the train center. 
He lines up the cars with the engine first, the boost last, and the blue and white cars in between. The same way every day. He's cool like that. I count his trains and he counts with me. He is the best counter ever. At first he would yell and grab a train for me. And we know that all young children have a hard time learning how to share. That is something that's just developmental. So this is a trick you can use with all your children to help them learn how to share. Mrs. Hope wrote a special story about Clay sharing his trains and read it to him. He loves to look at the story and the picture of him and me with the trains. He's getting much better at sharing. The special story Mrs. Hope wrote for Clay really helped. And in the story you'll see the time timer, which we'll talk about in Clay's story, but that is something that is evidence-based, helping children know first and then. That's a very effective behavioral strategy. You can talk to your kids about some friends need more help than others learning how to play and share. And we notice that Clay had a hard time sharing. Do you ever have a hard time sharing? Or let your kids talk about that. How can we help one another share? And if you have a problem sharing, you can go to the teacher and ask her to help. You can even ask the teacher to set the timer as another strategy. And you keep trying. You, keep, you realize that you, that friend might need some more help. And you also try to share, even though I know it's hard sometimes. Recess is my favorite. I love to play chase with my friends. We all take turns going super fast down the big slide, zoom. Clay loves to pick up little rocks and drop them down the drain the whole recess time. Every day, I run by him and call his name. He acts like I am invisible. Sometimes he watches all of his friends run by but he never chases us or slides down the slides. You know you've had kids in your class that are peripheral children who don't join in. They don't, they might be lacking in the social skills and the ability to initiate and join a group of children. That's something that sometimes just needs to be taught. Today we got a cool new bouncy car to play on at recess. We take turns acting like we're driving all of our friends to Disney World. We all call Clay to come ride with us. He walks over and watches us bounce up and down. He flaps his hands and he smiles. So cute. Guess what? He climbs on and bounces with us. It is autumn now, and Clay bounces with me every day. He chased me all around the playground today. He threw the colorful leaves in the air and he laughed and he laughed. How do Ruthie and her friends finally get Clay to join in? They keep trying. It's really important for children when they are playing with other children that may not have the same level of social skills as them, to realize that they need to be persistent. And that's one of those peer-mediated instruction skills we teach to a peer that we might choose to be that role model, and that would be a good fit. It helps, and it also, this is something you can tell the children, and bold is what you talk to the children about or what you say. It helps to figure out what your friend really likes and ask them to do the things with you that they like to do. Also, if they really like to talk about something special to them, like a special television show or book, character, or toy, you can talk with them about it. That's being exceptionally good friends. It's also a good skill for adults to have. At snack time, Clay just sits at the table and cries. Can my friend be hungry? Mrs. Hope holds up pictures of two choices for snack, fish crackers or apple slices. Clay just cries. I wish Mrs. Hope would just give him both, but I know she's trying to get him to use his words. She holds up a picture of fish crackers and says, I want fish crackers, please. She gives Clay three and he eats them up. For weeks now, Mrs. Hope has been giving Clay choices at snack time. Guess what happened today? Clay said, I want apples, please. He gets four apple slices from Mrs. Hope. We are happy that our friend used his words. We all cheer for our friends. So on this page, Clay finally uses his words to ask for a snack. How are his classmates good friends to him when he does this? They all cheer for him, right? You can be a good friend by cheering for your friends when they learn something new or when they're trying to do something that's hard for them and you can encourage them to not give up. That's being a good friend. I love to learn new things. This week we're learning about our five senses. Wow, I hear with my ears, smell with my nose, and taste with my mouth. See with my green eyes and touch and feel with my hands. Mrs. Hope tells us that some people's senses work differently. 
Some people might need to wear glasses to see better. Some people cannot hear well, so they can tell what people are saying by looking at their lips or by sign language. Mrs. Hope explained that some people have super sensitive senses. Lights may hurt their eyes, or everyday sounds may hurt their ears. I bet that's why Clay always covers his ears and squints his eyes. She told us that some people do not like the feel of sand or paint because their sense of touch is so sensitive. Some people's senses, sense of taste works too well. Some foods can taste really strong like an onion. Yuck. I bet that's why Clay only eats bread, goldfish crackers, or apples. I don't like it when my shirt has a scratchy tag. I always make Mommy take it out. I guess my sense of touch is too sensitive, too. We all have five senses, but everybody is a little different in how our five senses work. Now when I see someone who looks or acts differently, I will remember to be kind to them. Hooray for our five senses. And this is really the key, the key message of the book is when you see someone who looks or acts differently, to remember to be kind to them and to think maybe they're experiencing the world in a different way. Maybe their five senses work different. Maybe they see things in a different way or hear things in a different way. We check our schedules. It's time to go home. Mrs. Hope walks Clay to his bus. He pulls his hand away and runs to me. Clay uses his words. Bye-bye, Ruthie. Bye-bye, Ruthie. He keeps saying it over and over, but it, he does not look at my face. He gives me a big hug and smiles, his cutest smile. He made my day again. Mrs. Hope was right. Clay is an exceptionally good friend. So now I'm going to read to you Clay's story. And now I'm really going to talk about the embedded behavioral principles that are in reference from Clay's story to the middle part for adults. So it'll say Clay's story, page two and three. And you'll look at that and you'll see what evidence-based strategy is being used. So this is Clay talking. Oh no, Mommy. Mommy tells me a new school today. Clay, new friends. What is happening? Who are all these people? I hope they're nice to me. Where's Mommy going? I see my name on the floor where Mrs. Hope points. I stand on it. Music, I love music, if it is just right. This music is too loud. It makes my ears pound and hurt. I cover them and scream. Mrs. Hope turns it down. Just right music makes my heart beat slowly, makes me smile. I hum and spin in a circle. The children all sing, welcome to her class, and wave and smile. And there's something else um, for those in Palm Beach County, pre-K, both VBK and ESC. I know that you guys have recently incorporated um, Dr. Becky Bailey's strategies, Conscious Discipline. This book reflects a lot of those strategies. And what was interesting, I've been using Conscious Discipline for most of my teaching careers for 18 years. When I became a board certified behavior analyst, I was able to see the alignment of a lot of the strategies that were put in place with conscious discipline that align with behavioral principles. I pulled those into the book and also showed them being used in the book. So this curriculum can be used um, very easily with if, if you are using conscious discipline. The Just Right song is over. All the children sit on their names. I kneel and hum and sway. Mrs. Hope holds up a picture of children sitting in a circle with their legs crossed. I love pictures. My mind is full of pictures. I make my legs cross just like the picture. Mrs. Hope shows us all of the things we will do today. I do not understand all of her words, but I can understand a lot from the pictures. I keep checking my picture schedule. I need to know what will happen next to feel safe. And as I said earlier in the book, when you look in Clay's story, page two and three, schedules are evidence-based and then information about that. I try to include as many free things that teachers, I know you're on a tight budget, can download and use. And also using visuals with children. I found this greatly enhanced the behavior of my entire class, including the children who are neurotypical. When I showed them a picture of what they should look like, when we're in circle, legs crossed, hands in lap, looking at the teacher, instead of saying it, I would just hold up the picture. 
and I might point to one child who was not sitting correctly while I continued talking to the rest of the class so I didn't give that child a lot of attention. But when they see the picture, they're able to change their own behavior. We also know that there's people with different um, neurodiversity really can understand a lot more from pictures than from our words. Like Clay said, I don't understand all the words, but I do understand the pictures, and he complied. So that's a strategy that is successful for all children, is beginning to use visuals and schedules. A little girl zooms by on a blue scooter. I stretch out my wings and make my special sounds from Toy Story and chase after her. Zoom, zoom. I love to see the wheels turn and turn, round and round. Mrs. Hope takes me by my hand and shows me a picture of a big ball. I fall to the ground and start to cry and scream. Wheels are turning. I have to look at the wheels. Mrs. Hope tries to get me to sit on the yellow ball. No, ouch, it will hurt me. The girl in the blue scooter gets a red ball and sits on it right in front of me. She bounces and counts. One, two, three. Counting makes my heartbeat slow down. I sit on the yellow ball and bounce and count, just like the girl. The bouncing and counting makes me feel good, almost like the Just Right music does. So what does she do to help Clay? What does Ruthie do to be a good friend? She models for him. She shows him. Trains, trains, all in a row. First the red engine, next the passenger trains, last the caboose. Sixteen trains, all in a row. I lie down so that I can see all the wheels turning and I smile. My heart is just right. Another boy takes my passenger train. Why? Why did he take it? I scream. Has to be 16 trains. 16 trains. Has to be 16 trains. That shows he's not able to take the view of another person. Kids with developmental delay are later in developing that theory of mind and the ability to understand why people do what they do. So they may act react, react very strongly to other people's social cues or things that they do because they don't have the concept and the understanding of taking someone else's perspective. Mrs. Hope shows me a story about me. The story shows me that friends like trains too and that they like it when I share. The story says that I can count out trains and give my friend eight, and Mrs. Hope can set the big timer. When all the time is gone, then it's my friend's turn with the trains. I really do not want to share, but I choose for Mrs. Hope to set the timer anyway. This is a wonderful strategy when children have a hard time sharing. The children in my classroom would say, Miss Melissa, will you set the timer, please? They knew that was a strategy. I'd set the timer. When the time was up, they would exchange the toy. It cuts down on power struggles and gives the children the responsibility. Also, we're talking about an evidence-based strategy, which is social stories. Writing a story to help a child who has social delays and a delay in understanding others um, and what's going on um, there's, is a social story, and you can write that. And Mrs. Hope wrote one for Clay, and it helped him learn what to do in a situation that was hard for him. There's information in the evidence-based area on how to write a social story for a child in your classroom. My schedule says it's recess time. I search the ground for small rocks to drop down the drain. I love the plop, plop, plop of the rocks as they disappear. I feel calm when I do this. Children run by. I look at them from the corners of my eyes and keep dropping rocks. I see something new, a big car that bounces on springs. I love to bounce. I hear the children yell my name. I am scared, but I need to bounce too. Hey, bouncing is fun. I smile and my friends laugh and smile back. Ruthie jumps off the big car and runs. I follow her up the slide and down. That felt great. I still like to drop rocks down the drain, but I like to chase my friends too. They laugh and laugh and I make loud silly noises and I laugh too. The kids are so nice to me. I feel happy at my new school. You know, it's those little things, those little changes that we celebrate with children. And look at Clay making progress. He's beginning to chase a friend. He's beginning to engage in that social play with a peer. Every day, Mrs. Hope has all has all the children choose work off of the shelf. There's always new fun things to do. Sometimes I do not want to work. Mrs. Hope says, first do this work and then you get to choose. She shows me pictures of the work I, I have to do and then a picture of my very favorite thing, trains. I do my work so I can play with trains. I string beads, red, yellow, red, yellow. I sort pom-poms with tongs, I mix colors. I mix colors with an eyedropper. I use pop beads to make a necklace or write letters and shapes in the sand tray. Mrs. Hope always says this makes her hand strong so that we can be great writers. I want to write my name. This is a behavioral strategy first then, telling a child, 
First do this, then this. First do this, the broken record effect, then this. When a child does not want to follow a direction, just first this, then this. Repeatedly. It's actually called the PREMAC principle, and it's an evidence-based strategy. It goes along with your schedules. Also, I uh, love uh, the occupational therapist I've worked with, so I included some information about strengthening hands, um, and there's information in the center part. Today, the classroom is too loud and too busy for me. I feel scared and achy. I cover my ears. Mrs. Hope leads me to the safe center. I see pictures of faces frowning, laughing, and crying. I pick the frown face and hold it. I put a heavy blanket on my lap. I take deep breaths and blow on a windmill. I put headphones in my ears to block out the sounds of the class. I feel better. My heartbeat slows down. I put the sad face away. I leave the headphones on, but now I'm ready to finish the puzzle I was working on. And in our kit, we have the Creating Compassionate Children Hearts, which can be put in your calm corner, your safe center, whatever you call it, to help children as they take deep breaths and squeeze. It can help with calming. That's cognitive behavioral. And children can learn how to use those strategies. Sometimes it's a good thing for a teacher to do who's stressed out. More words are coming out of my mouth. I hear the other children and love to repeat exactly what they say. I like to carry around a book Mrs. Hope made with pictures of all the different things I like. I look at the pictures and can say the words easier. I get so mad when I cannot tell someone what I want. Sometimes I fall down and scream and kick. Why don't they know what I want? I wish there were a picture in my book for everything in my head that I do not have words for. And that gives us great empathy for kids who have a language delay when they're not able to express. That's often teaching a child a functional way to communicate can take the place and reduce tantrums. My schedule says it's time to go home. Mrs. Hope holds my hand and walks me to the bus. Ruthie is walking away. I pull away from Miss Hope. I have to tell Ruthie, my very best friend, goodbye. I hug her. Big hugs feel so good sometimes. Bye-bye, Ruthie. Bye-bye, Ruthie. Bye-bye, Ruthie. I'm ready to go home now. So that is the book. I'm going to show you a little bit about the curriculum guide, how it goes along with the book. And at the very end, Clay is so happy to have a, such a good friend like Ruthie. And he asks the kids, will you commit to being an exceptionally good friend like Ruthie was? So inside the kit, we have token economies. This is evidence-based. Right after a behavior that you choose, it can be used for an individual child. You can work out with a child every time you share a toy with a friend, hand a um, toy to a friend, and that might be replacing the behavior of grabbing or hitting. You're going to get a heart punched out. After four hearts, what do you want to do? And you can make a deal with a child. It represents, it's visual, and the child knows what they're working on, and you're very clear about the behavior you're reinforcing. It can also be used for a whole classroom where you all, where each child has an individual card and you decide as a group, once everyone fills their card or um, if half, you know, once half of us fill our card, then the whole group gets to have a pizza party or do something special. These can be reordered on the Creating Compassionate Children. We have a website that I'll show you at the end because these are consumables. Creating a sensory friendly classroom through brain breaks. Research shows that kids who move, it actually helps reduce their be unwanted behaviors. So we want children, we want to give children the opportunity to be active. I know there's a big push down to have more academics and letters and numbers in our pre-K classrooms. That may be so, but we can teach children they learn better, and research shows that children have more neuron, neural, neural connections and perform better on tests when they're more active. So we want to incorporate um, that into our classroom. We all know kids get the wiggles. So something that we have in the kit that is, um, let's see if I can get to it. I'll show it to you right here. There they are. Sorry about that. Brain break cards. These are really fun. This is something you can keep right by your door for transition time or in circle time. They're quick little fun activities. A brain break is short. It may be up just a minute. And so let's just see one of these. 
Just keep swimming. Everyone pretends to swim around the room. And you always set guidelines. If you're too loud or too silly, then you, and you're choosing not to be safe, you can have a seat. But this is just something, a quick little brain break, so everyone pretends to swim around the room. So you can just pick a couple of these. Wave into the class. The teacher might start, teach the class to do the wave, and everyone stands up and does it. Their brains get a little burst of, of happiness, of endorphins, when you get up and you move and you have fun together as a class. So these are a wonderful, um, just a tool that you can use. They help a child get in the just right state. You know, some kids are sometimes moving around too much and some kids are underactive, but a brain break can get them to the just right state. Also in the classroom, some kids need something in their hand to focus. A fidget. Now, it's important to set guidelines if you are going to introduce these to your classroom, that they're kept in your lap, that they, you have to be looking at your teacher and attending if you like to hold it. It's a privilege. And teaching the children how to use materials like this. The kids that would regularly be pulling, untying their neighbor's shoe or touching their neighbor, when you give them something in their hand, it can reduce that. It's a replacement to that unwanted behavior, and you reinforce them doing it correctly. Also in your curriculum guide, you have steps on how to make your own calming activities um, and calming materials to help children. Right here. There's also extension activities. For example, making up a cheer. There's a cheer already in here. Um, asking children to draw a picture of themselves acting in a kind way, just really focusing on kindness. What is kindness? You also have a poster to hang up, get caught being kind, a visual to remind everyone that that's what your classroom community is about, kindness, and you want to catch one another being kind. Going back to these cards, um, aligning it with conscious discipline, you often have the job of the kindness recorder. And someone could be in charge of pointing out when some people are kind and telling the teacher so that she'll be aware of it when you're using this for whole group. Also in here is this great resource. Speaking of speech, thank you for letting us use this. And it has kind and unkind acts that you can, if you're lucky enough to have a Promethean board and um, a board to put it all up on, or you could do small group or grow, blow them up to be bigger. And you sort and talk about which ones are kind and which ones are unkind. A visual. There's also a letter in here for you to send home to parents. Part of something else in the kit is this purple ribbon. The purple ribbon is used if children choose to make the commitment to be an exceptionally good friend, there's a special commitment that you have the children say as you tie a knot for each one. And I am gonna read that to you. So you would have your children, you would have a child come up to you and ask them, do you commit to being an exceptionally good friend? And then you would tie a knot for each one of these. I will look for the good in others, and the child would say that, make a commitment. I will use kind words, you would tie another knot. I will care and share, and I will be kind and try to be an exceptionally good friend to everyone. So if the child goes home with the ribbon, this, you can send this home to everyone, to all the parents, because it says if your child has the ribbon on, they've chosen to be, um, commit to be an exceptionally good friend. And then it encourages the parent to help carry over and generalize this behavior to the community. The outcomes the Creating Compassionate Children campaign, creating safer learning environments, increasing understanding of diversity, increase understanding of how to encourage sensory and emotional self-regulation in students, promote inclusion and friendships between diverse students, Decrease bullying, decrease discipline problems by helping you use evidence-based um, behavioral principles in your classroom. Foster social emotional skill development and develop ethical thinkers. And that is the promise ribbon. I jumped ahead. And the, that would be the commitment that the children would make. And you would make as well, hopefully. Additional resources. This is the webinar. 
Autism and Friendships, Peer Mediated Instruction. I also did another one for Hatch Early Learning that is um, evidence-based strategies for including children with autism in your classroom. These strategies can also be used with other children. And that is it. Thank you. Well, what's so amazing about the Unicorn Children's Foundation is their focus on the positive side of neurodiversity, that we're all unique and I am, you are. You know, nowadays it's almost like what is typical and looking at the strengths instead of a child's weakness. And they do such a beautiful job connecting in the community and educating people. And the Creating Compassionate Children campaign has been put together to help children develop empathy and understanding for their peers who are neurodiverse and different from them. Well, today we came in to read Exceptionally Good Friends by M Melissa Burkhart, and it's really an amazing book that gives a split view of kids with neurodiversity going through their first day of school and then kids who aren't as neurodiverse seeing it from an outside perspective. And I think reading it to the classroom of students, they're able to go, okay, well, you know, that's how I can make friends, that's how I can communicate, and then also, I'm not alone in the world. I'm not the only person who has really sensitive senses or someone who struggles to pay attention in class or needs pictures to communicate. I'm not by myself, and I think that's really empowering and inspiring to the kids. <laughs> Friends are important because they're the number one priority in school. Because if you don't have friends, you have no one to speak to, basically. Well, it was really great because these kids, when they read the book, really understood point of views from kids at school and how they're feeling. And I think that reading the book helps them feel comfortable and they kind of reacted in a great way. So I think that this book really helps them. It's important to teach kids when they're younger so when they get older, they know it's okay to be different. Along with the Creating Compassionate Children curriculum, we have a sensory kit that helps teachers learn more about how some people, a lot of people with neurodiversity and a lot of typical people have differences in how they process sensory information. So the kit helps the teacher understand that and then has some materials that they can provide to the children in their classroom to help them feel calmer and to focus and have less behavior issues. And I've always been interested in working with autism and neurodiversity related charities. However, many of the organizations that I worked with or that I researched, they treated neurodiversity as a disease or a condition, when in reality the Unicorn Children's Foundation encourages those differences and they just say it's a different way of viewing the world. When you do make a contribution to Unicorn Children's Foundation, you're making a contribution to the quality of life of everyone because when we go into a community and support everyone, the whole community benefits.